just uh, reading on an eight week book tour through America. And um, while I'm seeing all of you on Zoom, I am actually with Liz physically at the museum. So <laughs> it feels uh, more New York for me. Um, and I'm very excited to be able to talk a little bit to you about my book, Arthur and Lily. And maybe let me pre-state uh, that by saying that when I had planned this book tour, I thought I would be talking about Arthur. I would be talking about the fact that actually this year it's been 85 years since Crystal Night in November, uh, but also just 10 days ago was uh, 85 years anniversary of the kinder transport that saved so many Jewish children. And that was kind of like my plan that I had for this book tour. Um, then of course, October 7 happened. And for so many people, uh, especially Jewish people brought all of this much closer to home. And I, on this book tour where I spoke at over 40 places and many of them were synagogues, um, which you did of course really realize and see um, a different, it, it was a different book tour, let's say, than I had planned. Um, I do believe that now more than ever, it is important to teach about the Holocaust against anti-Semitism. I do also understand that people right now might not want to hear about the Holocaust because like the news is already so depressing. Um, but my book is actually quite hopeful, uh, which I hope that you will also see by the end of today. And this has been the experience during this book tour. Um, and let me share my screen because I have some nice photos that I can show with all of you um, about this book, Arthur and Lily. And let me start by telling you how I came to write a book about a Holocaust survivor named Arthur. And that is that we both grew up in the same apartment that you can see here in Vienna in Austria. In the second floor of this house, of this house uh, both of us spent our childhood. So Arthur grew up there in the 1930s and I grew up there in the 1990s. So 60 years apart, we randomly spent our childhood in the same apartment. And I first met him when I was 11 years old and looked much cuter than I do today. Um, and this was 20 years ago. And he, uh, by then, living in California and Los Angeles for a very long time, he had a strong urge to see this apartment. Um, he was the last, uh, or he was the only survivor of his immediate family, the only person in his immediate family that survived the Holocaust. And so this apartment for him was a very special place, tell the uh, very high emotional significance. So it was important for him to be able to go there and see it again. And for him, it was like a trip down memory lane uh, to a time when he had a happy childhood, to a time also when he still had another name. So he was born Oswald Canberg, and only in America he became an Arthur. Um, so in the next 30, 40 minutes, whenever I'm going to say Oswald, I mean the child. And when I say Arthur, I mean the adult. And over the years, we became very close. We spent many times together. Um, this photo here, I don't know who many of you were um, in this audience are Jewish tonight, but actually 10 years ago, Hanukkah and Thanksgiving was on the same day. So you can see here that um, our turkey was looking very distinctly Jewish and is wearing a yarmulke. And this is just one of the many, many um, events and celebrations that I spent together with Arthur's family. And in writing my book, um, I kind of picture this, I kind of mirror this, so I jump around in the times. So the book is primarily his biography. It is primarily the story how he survived the Holocaust. But I also talk about how I met him and what this meant for me. And I also, what I did is I retraced his route. Like I traveled to all the places in Austria, in France, in America that he had spent uh, time in as a child, as a refugee. And so I kind of followed this route. And so today I will mostly tell you his biography, but I will also share some anecdotes. And if we start by looking at his family, um, we are now in the 1920s, 1930s in Vienna, a Jewish middle-class family named Kernberg. 
And here you can see Oswald's mother, Frida. And Frida is remembered by everyone to be a terrible cook. Which, you know, I find kind of mean because, I mean, first of all, she looks very nice. Uh, secondly, she actually brought a factory into the marriage, a family factory, a knitting factory that she ran together with her husband. Uh, but all people remember about her is that she was a terrible cook and that it only tasted well when she served fruit. Because how can you like mess up serving fruit? Whereas her husband, Hermann, um, who you see here, and um, he's remembered to be a funny, outgoing jokester. Um, he always had candy in his pockets for the neighborhood children. So Oswald quite liked him. And Hermann, he did pray every morning. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen like Orthodox prayer, you put in tefillin, it's called tefillin, it's like leather straps that you put around your arm and around your head. And he did that every morning to pray. But then he broke Shabbat by working on Saturday. So it is definitely a Jewish family, but semi-religious. Also Oswald and his brother Fritz, they had a tutor in religion, but they almost never went to the synagogue. This is quite common for a Jewish middle-class family in Vienna of the interwar times, where it is a Jewish family, but not too religious. And uh, then we have Oswald, our main character. And let me tell you that Oswald really was not a good boy. And he would be the first one to admit this. I mean, Orpha almost proudly told me so many stories of all the nonsense he got into. And my favorite story is that one time he was petting a horse, a carriage horse, and he carefully plucked some hair from the tail of the horse. And then he went home and he would have been maybe eight, nine years old at the time. And he took an egg, carefully made a hole into the egg, put the horse hair into the egg. And then he found it hilarious when his mother like cracked the egg for cooking and freaked out because there was horse hair in the egg. Um, just to give you an idea of what kind of boy he was. And also he had a tendency to blame his older brother Fritz. Um, Cause I mean, of course, the nonsense, the shenanigans were found out. And then he had a tendency to blame his older brother, Fritz. And because Frida was also working in the factory um, with her husband and running the factory, uh, the family employed nannies, uh, live-in nannies that lived with them in the apartment. And over the years, there were several kinds of nannies. And Oswald would always remember best a nanny named Agnes. And I think he remembered Agnes best because one day Agnes didn't show up to work anymore. And that was in March, 1938. So in March, 1938, we have what is called the Anschluss, the annexation of Austria to Nazi Germany. So the Nazis had come to power in Germany in 1933 they were elected lawfully, but quickly it turned into a dictatorship. And then five years later is the annexation of Austria. And we call it an annexation and not an occupation because not a single shot was fired. And actually most people in Austria stood cheering in the streets, quite happy that the Nazis came. The big difference that you have between Nazi Germany and Nazi Austria is that all these many, many anti-Jewish laws that had taken five years in Germany to be enacted happened overnight in Austria. So the shock in Austria to the Jewish people was much bigger because all these laws, like you couldn't work in a lot of professions or you couldn't go to the cinema anymore, they all happened overnight. And one of these many laws was that a Christian woman could no longer work for a Jewish family. And that is why Agnes the nanny didn't show up for work anymore. And actually because the shock was so much bigger, um, statistically more Austrian Jews survived the Holocaust than German Jews because they felt a stronger urge to emigrate, to flee. But not Oswald's family. Oswald's family, they were quite optimistic. They were hoping for the good old days. They thought the Nazis, it would just be a phase. So they actually had several 
possibilities where they could have tried to flee and they didn't take them. And even then when Crystal Knight happened um, 85 years ago, this didn't really change too much either. During that night, an uncle was arrested and sent to concentration camp. And only when this uncle was released in February 1939 and told everyone what happened in the camp, this is now when Oswald's parents also realized they should try and save their, their family. But February 1939 is incredibly late already, especially if your whole family trying to get visa. And it's very hard. So at first, they now decide to try and save their boys, and they sign them up to a, for a kinder transport. And you can see here the application form. And so a kinder transport is really the only positive, or one of the few positive things that happened during these terrible times. It is the biggest rescue operation during the Holocaust. It is 15,000 Jewish children that could be saved because their parents were willing to separate from these children and to send the children away by themselves to countries like France, like England, like Belgium. If you've heard of the Kinder Transport, you've probably heard of the Kinder Transport to England because it is by far the largest. It is 10,000 children that went to England. But um, there's also other ones. And if you look at this form, you will see the form is in French. So Oswald and his brother Fritz were signed up for the Kinder Transport to France. All the children, they were between two and 16 years of age and they had to be completely healthy. There was actually a selection process in only sending healthy children. And from today's perspective, of course, this is terrible to think about. Uh, the Jewish social workers at the time did it with the best of intentions because they were afraid that if a child is going to attract negative attention in London or in Paris, that these governments might not allow more children in. So they selected well-behaved, healthy children. And this is a very tragic consequence in the Kernberg family, because both brothers are signed up for kinder transport, but only Oswald is allowed to go. And his brother Fritz uh, suffered from epilepsy. And because of this epilepsy, he, he was not chosen for the kinder transport. So only the younger one, Oswald, was allowed to go to Paris and Fritz had to stay behind with his parents uh, in Vienna, in Austria. And of course, in the book, I explain this in more detail. And if you have any questions about this, um, there will be plenty of time afterwards. I'm going to read a short paragraph now from the book. And it talks about Oswald saying goodbye to Vienna. Um, and it went very quickly. So this form here, the application was filled out in February 39 and already in March, Oswald and the other children left Vienna. Frieda and Hermann Kernberg repeatedly assured their son that this was a temporary separation and that the family would soon emigrate to America together. The night before he left, Oswald snuck into the dining room and carefully opened the large cupboard. In front of him stood his parents' photo albums, which they had browsed through together so many times. Oswald opened one of them and began to pull out photos. Hermann Kernberg in a suit and hat, a pocket handkerchief in his breast pocket. Frieda in a dark dress and with a big smile. Fritz with a slightly sloppy tie his eyes directed upwards. Oswald as a grumpy toddler sitting on his grandfather's lap. Carefully, Oswald pocketed the black and white photographs and put them in his suitcase. I wanted to have them with me, Arthur told me later. And I'm glad that I took the pictures. It is the only thing that I've really left of my parents. And so then the next day, um, Oswald and 50 other children were put on a train to Paris. And the big difference between the French and the British kindertransport is that in England, 
most of the children were sent into foster families. But in France, from the very beginning, they wanted to do collective housing. They wanted to open refugee children's homes because they were they believed that it was going to be far less isolating and less traumatizing for these children to be among a group of peers than to be all alone in a family where they don't know anyone and don't speak the language. But these homes were not ready by the time the children arrived in France, because the priority had been to bring them to France. So actually, um, the kids, they spent three days in a hospital, then they spent uh, three weeks in a monastery. It was a very unstable situation. And also a lot of the children thought they had been sent away as punishment. They didn't really understand what was happening. Because you need to remember, as I said, some of these children were two, three years old. I mean, they didn't understand anything. But the six, the seven, the eight-year-olds, a lot of them thought they were sent away as punishment, that they must have done something bad that their parents sent them away. Um, Oswald actually had once been beaten up by the Hitler youth. And so this helped him to understand that he was safer in France, that this was a good thing. But as I just read to you, his parents had told him it would be a temporary situation. And so he was also very homesick and kept writing home very sad letters. And all of this changed when he finally moved and he moved to this beautiful place here. And I'm gonna read another short part. Two newly adapted country houses amidst a magnificent park on a hill near Paris have become the home of 130 little immigrants. Trude Frankel wrote in a letter to the Viennese Jewish community. She continued, furnished in the spirit of Montessori, these children's houses with all their little colorful furniture and walls painted with funny children's scenes are a delightful sight. For the time being, the children live without any special duties they only learn French and do a lot of crafts and gardening, and they make an infinitively happy impression. Frankl's almost euphoric report paints a completely different picture than the previous descriptions of the first few weeks in France. So what had happened? Oswald and over a hundred children had moved. They now lived in the Villa Helvetia in Montmorency, a suburb just under 10 miles from Paris. Um, and if you take a close look now, this is what it looked like in the 1930s, very pretty villa. This is what it looks like today. It is a police station today, a somewhat rundown police station. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, I traveled to all the places that Oswald had been as a child. Um, and so I also came to this police station I think it was in 2017 already. And this was a time when there were a lot of um, terror attacks happening in France. So it's not like you could just walk into a police station and start taking photos. Um, that would have been very suspicious. So actually, this visit had to be granted by uh, the French Department of Interior. And when they did finally allow me uh, to come, they admittedly found it quite fascinating that a foreign historian wanted to see their tiny village police station. Um, so they actually sent a police photographer along. And that's why we have photos like this. And you have to kind of imagine this is the police they sent into Paris when there's trouble. So they were all wearing like the boots and the vests and the machine guns, but they were incredibly French. So I've not, I've never gotten so many hand kisses before than by all these uh, French policemen. They were very polite. And so I came there with so many questions because I wanted to get a better understanding of how the children had, feel, had felt living there. Because if you only ever hear about a place uh, described by 10 year olds, um, then you get kind of like a wrong idea of the place. I mean, the children said it's a castle. And I mean, it's a villa, it's big, but it's not a castle. But if you're a small child, of course, it looks much bigger to you. And so I came there with so many questions. 
But in the end, it was actually me answering questions all the time because none of these police officers had any idea of the history of their building and they didn't know it used to be a refugee children like they didn't know it was a children's home and they definitely didn't know it was a refugee children's home and actually for the time um, when the children arrived there before the war started we still have a lot of photos. And so I could show them these photos and could explain to them what was happening with the children. And um, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Uh, let me try, but this here would be Oswald. I'm trying to, yeah, okay, you can see my mouse. This is Oswald here. And the children were now being taken care of by an organization called OSE, O-S-E, OSE. Uh, originally Russian Jewish organization uh, that had branched out over Europe and the French OSE opened four refugee children's houses around Paris and these homes they were run by Austrian and German teachers so while the children most definitely learned French and went to French schools when they came back to the home they were surrounded by their own language and their own culture and most importantly became the man that you can see here standing, it's Ernst Papanek, and he was the director of these homes. He was a political enemy of the Nazis. So he had come to France as a political enemy. And in the time he worked in these children homes, I mean, he installed an education system that was so progressive that you would still call it modern today. Um, at the time, it was quite revolutionary. He was very far ahead of his time. And I could talk about him for hours, but um, let me just give you some highlights. Basically, Papanek cared more about the mental health of the children than he cared about their spelling. So one of the many things he did is he installed a vast student co-administration there was a student parliament and there was a student court and there was also like a party committee and a food committee and a sports committee. There were incredibly many committees to teach the children democracy after having lived in a dictatorship. More importantly, to teach the children that they are in control over their own lives. And it's not the Nazis making decisions, it's themselves making decisions. And a decision has a consequence and then you have to live with the consequence. Um, he also sent all the children to therapy, which if you ask them today in their 80s and 90s, they will most certainly tell you that there was no therapy because they didn't realize it. Um, but it was play therapy, it was art therapy, it was hidden as a game to the children, but it most certainly uh, was therapy. Also, Papanek said his main goal is to make the children happy again and to treat them like children again and not like young adults and everything that they, after everything they had experienced in Nazi Germany. And he believed that a great way to treat children like children and to make them happy is to throw a party. So there are so many parties, like every birthday, every French or Jewish holiday, there would be cake and there would be singing and a circus. There are really a lot of parties. The photo that you see here, it is actually not a party that he organized. It is a surprise birthday party that the children organized for him. It is his uh, 39th birthday. And yes, I know he looks much older. Um, he is really only 39 years old in this photo. And this birthday happened in late August of 1939. And so you can say it is kind of the last happy moment for the children, the last carefree moment before World War II broke out. And um, World War II broke out on September 1st with the Germans attacking Poland, but the French and the British had promised Poland support. And so everyone from the very beginning thought there would also be immediately a war in France. And if there had been an air raid attack, these homes were so close to the center of Paris that they would have been in the danger zone. And so... Um, Papanek tried to prepare the children for this. 
On September 1st, Ernst Papanek visited each of the four homes. For Papanek, absolute honesty towards children was of central importance. And so he informed them about the upcoming war without any whitewashing. To calm down the frightened children, Papanek actively engaged them in the preparation for their own defense. The boys, like Oswald, filled sandbags and stacked them in front of the windows on the ground floor. The girls sewed rubber bands to washcloths, which could be dipped in a sodium solution and serve as makeshift gas masks in the event of a gas attack. Um, this is because of experiences from World War I that everyone was incredibly afraid of a gas attack. Um, and you can see the boy in the middle, he's wearing a gas mask. So very soon, everyone in France um, had to, wherever they went, they had to walk around with a gas mask. And the photo shows children at night during an air raid when they go uh, down to the basement. In troubled times like this, it was important to give the children structure. And so the Ose did not change the familiar daily routines despite the beginning of the war. The children still had to get up at seven o'clock, even if they had spent half the night in the basement. To make them feel less helpless, each child was given a special task during air raid alarms, even if it was just to turn off the light. And then there were two boys who during every air raid carried down the Torah to the basement. Um, so there's four homes and three of them are religiously liberal or not religious at all. And one of the homes is Orthodox. And this home has a, has a Torah that is carried down during the air raids. Actually, the thing is that we have a war now and it turns out that nothing happens. Um, it turns out that for six months, there's not a single attack and that all these air raids that I just read you about turned out to be false alarms. And this is called in English, the phony war, like the weird war where nothing is happening. And I think that the German word explains it much better because in German, we call it a Sitzkrieg, which means a sitting war. And that means basically you have the French and the Germans sitting across from each other at the border. And the border is so well fortified that no one can attack. And so actually for another six months, the children continue to live relatively peaceful at these children homes. And here you can see two photos of Oswald at the time, 1939, 1940. Um, the photo on the left side, he was always incredibly, incredibly proud of because he knitted the sweater himself. Like literally every single time in my life I've seen this photo, it had to be pointed out that he knitted the sweater himself. Um, I mean, it has a zipper. It's a nice sweater for an 11 year old boy to be able to knit, uh, but very proud of this. And so, as I said, for six months, nothing happens. The children continue to live quite peacefully and then everything happens overnight. And that is in uh, May 10th, 1940, when the German army, instead of attacking France, they now attack Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg. These tiny neutral countries, I mean, they basically overrun them. They occupy them within a short, uh, short day, short couple of days. And then, of course, it is much easier to get through Belgium into France than through Germany into France. So they make it very quickly into France and within only four weeks, uh, they reach Paris. And this is, of course, the second big difference to the British kinder transport that large parts of France were occupied by the Germans and that you, have, that you had to save the children a second time. And so they have to evacuate them to the south of France. And you cannot compare this at all with the kinder transport that happened 15 months before, because as traumatic the kinder transport had been in leaving their parents, I mean, the children went on a train and they got off a train. It was a regular train trip. 
But now you have 10 million people trying to get to the south of France at the same time. So the trains are incredibly overcrowded. Um, the children end up throwing their luggage out of the windows to make space for more refugees. Uh, the trains keep getting rerouted because the tracks are bombed. And Arthur also told me that looking out the window, he could see uh, corpses in the fields. So it was a very traumatic train trip for these children, but they all manage, the OCA manages to get all of them to the south of France, to the unoccupied part of France. And they find a castle, an empty castle, and they open a new home. And I mean, they don't have enough food. And as I told you, the children, they threw out their luggage, so they don't have enough clothing. But on day two already, the OC starts with classes again. The OC wants them to keep a structure going and to be as, um, to keep them in a, as normal structure as possible. And if you look at the photo, you can also see that they're still doing picnics. Um, and I've been doing a lot of readings in schools over these last weeks, and they love this photo because you can see so many kids doing like bunny ears. Um, it's a very silly photo. Everyone's kind of pretending. And then you see this is Oswald, the boy here next to the teacher. And this boy is like biting his arm or kissing his arm. Like I never quite understood what he's doing. Um, but they were having a good time, as you can see in the photo. And I actually know a lot of people in this photo. I, not, I don't only know Oswald who would become Arthur as an adult. I know a number of people in this photo and all of them have talked about this incredibly feeling of community, of close-knittedness that, ex that they experienced hiding in these children homes with the other children in the South of France. And they started feeling like a family. And they started calling themselves brothers and sisters. And they still do this today. In their 80s and 90s, they call them brothers, themselves brothers and sisters. But of course, Oswald had an actual brother and he had parents. We cannot forget his real family. So if we look at what's happening with them at this time, and we are now already in 1941, then sadly, they did not manage to get out of Austria. They tried a lot of things, but they couldn't get out. And so they are among the last group of Jews still in Austria. And then they are um, arrested and deported to a ghetto in Poland. And really their only hope, their only solace is knowing that little Oswald is safe in the South of France. Because they believed that he was safe in the South of France. But sadly, as history has taught us, this is not true. Because this unoccupied part of France, often called Vichy France, very soon started collaborating with the Germans. And now then, it is actually French police arresting Jews. It is not German police, it is French police. And so everyone realizes that the children are not safe and they need to try to get the children out of France. And what they do now is they organize a second kinder transport, this time to America. This kinder transport is incredibly unknown. I mean, I've been to conferences with other historians who spent their career researching the kinder transport, who tried to tell me there was not a kinder transport to America uh, because it is such an unknown story. Uh, but it did most certainly happen in 1941 and it is children who come from the south of France, through Spain, through Portugal, and then on a ship to America. And most of these children were originally on the first kinder transport. So most of them are the same German and Austrian kids that we already had for a year and a half. And now there's also some French or Belgium Jewish children with them. And this boy here is Oswald. You can see him here. So this kinder transport to America was incredibly difficult to organize. I mean, it's the middle of the war now, and there is a dozen organizations involved in this. Uh, the OSA, of course, uh, the Quakers, um, Eleanor Roosevelt was involved in this. 
unlike her husband, she always quite supported refugee causes. Uh, Marshall Fields from the Chicago department store was involved in this. There was just so many groups that it actually created a lot of chaos. I mean, I've been to so many archives. I've read thousands of letters and documents. And when you do that, it makes you wonder how they managed to save a single child because they're fighting the entire time. There's so much jealousy. There's so much intergen like interorganizational bickering. Um, sometimes you just like want to pack them and like shake them and remind them that they're all trying to work towards the same goal. It is very frustrating to read these letters. Um, and also on top of that, it is the middle of the war and that makes everything much harder. So to give you a very, um, to give you one example, a very mundane problem is, so each child needed four visa, right? You needed a visa to be able to leave France. You needed a visa to transit through Spain, a transit visa for Portugal, and a visa to enter the United States. And the problem now was that at all the consulates in Marseille, they didn't have any staplers left. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but it is a huge problem because it's the middle of the war and there's everything is missing. They don't have any staplers. So we have 400 children visa and we have 100 children passports and we need to get the visa into the passports or the children will not be allowed to leave. And so the teachers end up sitting at night hand sewing the visa into the passports. Just to give you an idea of what literally mundane things could have derailed this entire operation. Very surprisingly, it did actually work. They not only saved Oswald, they saved 300 children to America um, in the middle of the war. And then they arrived here in Staten Island, which there really is not much to see, but that's where their, their ship docked. And they arrived, Oswald arrived on Labor Day, uh, September 1st, 1941, because it was Labor Day, customs wasn't working. So the children were not allowed to get off the boat. They got off the boat on September 2nd. And on the one hand, the children are now safe. I mean, there's no Nazis, no one can get to them in America. Physically, they're safe. But what happens in America is that they're separating the children. Because in America, social workers at the time believed a child should be in a family. It should, and if it's not a family, it should be a foster family. And so they sent them all over America to foster families all over the country. And they didn't give them each other's addresses. Because they believed at the time the quicker you become an American, the better. And the best way to become American is to completely forget your past. And so they didn't give them the other children's addresses. And this is an opinion that was like, until the 1980s, this is how they handled things. Um, Papanek, I mean, was freaking out. He tried everything to keep the children together. But this is when we can see how far ahead he was of his time. And I mean, this is what we have learned over the years from him today. That is, when you work with unaccompanied minors today, you mostly prefer a group setting over foster families. Because while, of course, the initial thought always is a child belongs in a family, if the family doesn't have uh, doesn't speak the same language, doesn't have the same cultural or ed educational or religious background, it can be much more traumatizing and isolating for a child to be there all alone than to be together with peers going through the same thing. And for these uh, kinder transport children, this is their trauma. This is their trauma because they had somehow survived the separation from their families by finding this new family in France. And now this was taken away for them. And this is the time they talk about the least later. And this is the most traumatic time for them. And so Oswald stayed in New York. He came to a foster family in the Bronx. And quite soon after his arrival in America, he had his bar mitzvah. 
Um, a bar mitzvah, um, for those of you who might not know, a bar mitzvah is really the most important religious ceremony in the life of a Jewish child. It is the ceremony that makes you an adult, that you study for a long time, and after that, you have to um, follow all the religious laws. And as part of the ceremony, the bar mitzvah child has to recite the Torah portion of the day. And I don't know if you can read it, it's at the lower end of the picture. Uh, Oswald's bar mitzvah was Shabbat Lech Lecha, which if you're Jewish, uh, you probably know because it's a very um, known passage, but I am going to read it. It was November 1st, 1941 two weeks after Oswald's 13th birthday and the day of his bar mitzvah. Oswald's bar mitzvah was on Shabbat Lech Lecha, the Shabbat on which the Lech Lecha Torah section from the first book of Moses is read in the synagogue. Whether it was coincidence or fate, Oswald recited his own story in front of the assembled community. And the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your land and from your birthplace and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. But for the young boy, this was not what he remembered best about the day. Nobody came to my bar mitzvah, Arthur told me. A bar mitzvah should be a joyous occasion, but for me, it was one of the saddest days of my life. Oswald stood alone in a sea of strangers. Frieda and Hermann Kernberg were barred from attending their son's day of honor, but in their minds, they were with him. On October 19th, Oswald's actual birthday, they sent him an emotional letter from Poland, which reached New York at the end of December. My dearest loved one, today on your birthday, as well as your day of bar mitzvah. We all, that is dearest mother, your brother Fritz and I are sitting in a very tiny room and are constantly thinking and talking about you. Hermann Kernberg wrote from a ghetto in Poland. My golden sweet Burli, in my thoughts, I lift my hands over your head and bless you with the blessing from the Bible. May God bless, shelter, and protect you, and always hold his right hand over you. Amen. Was the last time Oswald ever heard from his family. And I'm, I'm going to jump ahead a bit now. Um, so Oswald is now a teenager in New York. Um, this letter really is the last time he ever hears from his parents. He is a foster child, but he's quite gifted, especially in the sciences. Um, so as you can see here, he went to Stuyvesant High School. I mean, still today, one of the most prestigious schools in America. Um, and I actually spoke there a couple of weeks ago. Um, I went to the Jewish history class and spoke about um, Oswald there. This now also is the time when Oswald starts calling himself Arthur. Because first of all, Oswald is not a common name in America, but the problem is that there is actually one thing named Oswald. And that is, um, I don't know if any one of you has ever heard of Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. And I see no one. And sometimes people have heard of him. So Oswald the Lucky Rabbit is the first cartoon that Walt Disney did before he invented Mickey Mouse. Oswald looks exactly like Mickey Mouse, but has long bunny ears. And then there was like a copyright issue and Walt Disney cut off the ears and made a mouse out of it. But it really looks exactly the same. And I mean, this is the 1940s and it is the first cartoon ever. So, of, I mean, incredibly popular, everyone knew it. And kids being kids, everyone made fun of Oswald. Like Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Uh. So, I mean, he hated it. So he had just chose Arthur. Arthur is a neighborhood boy uh, that had stood up for him once, defended him. And so Oswald liked it and he liked the name. So he decided to call himself Arthur. And later on, he would also shorten uh, the Kernberg to Kern 
to make it sound less Jewish. So he became Arthur Kern. Um, if you look at the, the diploma though, you can only officially change your name when you become an adult. And so that's why on his high school diploma in 1947, he is still listed as Oswald, uh, but by four years at this time had been calling himself Arthur. So he graduates in 1947. Then he gets a scholarship um, to study for free in New York, where he becomes an engineer. And it is around this time when he is maybe um, 18, maybe 19 years old, that he makes a very conscious decision. And it is he decides to make peace with his past. So none of you know him, of course, but you have to believe me. I mean, Arthur was the happiest man I met in my entire life. I'd never met a more optimistic, a more joyous man as Arthur. And so many times he told me, Lily, I had a wonderful life. You know, there was a short while that wasn't so great, but overall it was a wonderful life. And he also told me, you have to fight the hate in your heart. So he realized at a young age that the Austrians didn't know he was hating them. And the Germans didn't know he was hating them. And also some Nazis hiding somewhere in Argentina did not know he was hating them. So who is the only person who knows this hate is himself. And so the only person suffering from this hate is also himself. And so he decided to stop. And I, I mean, I find this incredibly inspiring, especially at such a young age. And of course, he's not the only Holocaust survivor who ever came to this conclusion. Um, there's a beautiful book called The Power of Forgiveness by an Auschwitz survivor. But I think she was in her 60s when she wrote it. And Arthur was really quite young. And I know he was this young because by the time he meets his future wife, she always told me that he was already this happy, optimistic man so that he, it had, had to have happened before. And I'm sure it had something to do with Papa Nick too, because um, I know a lot of kinder transport children, both on the French and the British kinder transport, and you can kind of see a difference in their mental health attitude in to, from the French children. Had They were able to process this better in many cases than the British children. Um, but still, I mean, quite a remarkable decision at such a young age. And then very soon after, he meets Trudy. Um, Trudy and Arthur were sitting next to each other during an exam at City College, and Arthur was copying from Trudy. And then Trudy said, you know, maybe we should study together so you don't have to copy from me. And um, Trudy, actually, she also came by herself to America, but already in 1938, her mother put her on the Queen Mary together with a sister and sent them by themselves to America. And Trudy became very American. And she, uh, to a point where she would say she only wants to marry a real American, like a real American. Um, and her aunt used to joke, like, where are we going to find an Indian for her? I mean, what is even a real American, right? So they discussed about it and they decided he had to be second generation. Third generation would be even better. And to understand the story, you need to know that Trudy, until today, in her mid-90s, has the strongest German accent you've heard in your entire life. Like, she literally sounds like she came off the boat yesterday. And Arthur didn't have an accent. And his name is Arthur. So she just assumed that he is a real American. And only when Trudy introduced Arthur to her parents and he started speaking German to them, all of this came out. And you know, then it's already too late. Trudy quite liked him. So the photo on the right side is their wedding photo. Uh, they got married in 51, graduated in 52, both of them engineers, which as a woman, Trudy in the early 50s, quite extraordinary. And then they move to California and because that's where the industry is at the time. And Arthur starts working as a rocket scientist, a rocket engineer. 
Um, he is the good looking young man here. And here sitting, you see an astronaut. Um, so Arthur was involved in the moon landing. Admittedly, 400,000 people were involved in the moon landing, um, but he was one of them. And he has a very neat Apollo Achievement Award. And I mean, again, it's almost comically the American dream story of this uh, young refugee boy sent away by his parents to France, makes it to America. And as I like to say, makes it almost to the moon. Um, so it is quite the, the story. And this was a very quick retelling of his entire life, pressed into 30 minutes. But uh, before I end, there's two more things I want to talk about. One, no one was able to separate these children from each other. All the social workers did not succeed. All the children found each other again. Here you can see them in 1989 at the 50 year reunion of the, kinder, of the French kinder transport. And all the children, they found each other, they found Papanek, no one could keep them away from each other. Um, sometimes it was coincidences, they ran into each other. And then when they became older, they started actively looking for each other um, through newspaper ads. And there's a group of maybe six, seven people that actually moved out to California following Arthur. And they became like they did Hanukkah together. They did Thanksgiving together. They became the aunts and the uncles for their own children. So it is still very much till today, this family feeling that they all had experienced in France and that moves forward to today, which is why I know so many of them because meeting Arthur meant meeting a lot of them. His entire family and social circle was other um, children from France. And the second thing I want to talk about before we go into the discussion is, why is this book called Arthur and Lily? Why is it not just called Arthur? And that is, um, so let me briefly talk a little bit about how my life was changed by meeting Arthur. As I said in the beginning, I was 11 years old. And then I, later I started studying history. I became an expert on the, uh, on the French, uh, on the kinder transport in general. And right now I'm getting my PhD in Jewish history, all because as an 11 year old girl, I met this Holocaust survivor. Um, and people always wanna know, so I am not Jewish myself. So meeting Arthur was my first time knowingly meeting a Jewish person, the first time I really heard about the Holocaust and it had quite the impact on my life. And this and one more thing, and that is that my mother signed me up for a student high school history project. So we knew beforehand that Arthur was coming to visit us. And I mean, admittedly, I was 11. I didn't think about this too much, but my mother found it kind of hard, um, the idea of now knowing that we lived in an apartment where everyone had been killed except the one person that was coming to visit us. And we didn't know that he was such a happy man at the time. I mean, he could have had a nervous breakdown in our living room. That, was, that doesn't sound so far-fetched. So my mother wanted, to da wanted there to be more. And then he comes, he leaves, we never talk about it again. So my mother signed me up for the student history project called A Letter to the Stars. And it was an Austrian, Austria-wide project where high school students researched um, the biographies of Austrian Holocaust victims. And so I wrote a short biography of Frieda, of Arthur's mother. And so even before Arthur came, he answered some questions by email. And then remember the photos he had stolen, like he brought these photos that he had stolen to show them to me. And so I wrote this short text about Frida and the project is called A Letter to the Stars um, because in a very moving ceremony, we let go of 80,000 white balloons for attached with 80,000 letters 
for the 80,000 Austrian Holocaust victims. And so I, my, one of the balloons is mine, addressed to Frida. Um, the place where this is happening, it's called Hero Square. It is famously where Hitler had stood in Vienna and announced the annexation of Austria and everyone was cheering. And so this is where we let go of these balloons. And uh, they had actually, they had to close down the airspace because 80,000 balloons is a lot of balloons. And what happened now is that through a crazy chain of coincidences um, that was started by my mother signing me up for this project because we, we knew we were going to meet Arthur. And um, the first step is that the project liked to use me for publicity a lot. Because, you know, it's a cute story, this 11-year-old girl living in the same apartment as this Holocaust survivor. So I, uh, there's this article that you can see here, and it shows me holding this photo of Frida that I showed you before. And then the next uh, day, a woman starts calling the newspaper, and she demands to get my family's contact information. Um, and of course, they don't tell her, but she keeps calling, she keeps calling. In the end, uh, the paper calls my mother and says, please, crazy lady keeps calling. No one is getting any work done. <laughs> please just talk to her. So my mother calls this woman and it turns out that she was not crazy. She was actually 83 years old. And for over 60 years, she had been keeping a package from Arthur's parents. And she recognized the photo of Frida in the newspaper. So in 1941, when the parents were deported to Poland, the father packed the package. And the package contained um, passports and insurance policies, just like family and business documents. And always the optimist, the father believed with this package, if you somehow make it back from Poland, with the package, you can restart your life. And if not, there's little Aussie, Oswald in France, and he should get it. So the father gave this package to his best friend. But the best friend was half Jewish and was also afraid of keeping it. And the best friend gave it to his 18-year-old cousin. And now the 18-year-old cousin is the woman who over 60 years later recognized Frida's picture in the newspaper. Um, she never had managed to find Arthur after the war, but through many times of moving apartments, she always kept the package. And so now she was able to return it. And I'm sure you can imagine that Arthur's and my friendship uh, became so much closer, so much more important by this returning of this package than if we really had met one time and never really saw each other again. So Arthur came back to Austria a couple more times. When I was 16, I was allowed to fly to America for the first time by myself. And so uh, we spent lots of time together. And very soon, Arthur and his wife, Trudy, started introducing me as their Austrian granddaughter. And you can see in the photos the other granddaughters that uh, luckily did not have a problem with, with another one arriving. Um, and I, so to this day, we we're very close. I just spent Thanksgiving with them. And I mean, basically for Arthur, this um, friendship brought a new connection to Austria, to his home. And I got this huge Jewish American family and I became a Holocaust historian. So both of our lives were really very influenced by this meeting. And um, I'm almost finished and very much looking forward to your questions. I wanna read one last paragraph and it is actually um, the first paragraph of the book, but it just leads itself nicely to finish. I'm writing this book almost 15 years after my first meeting with Trudy and Arthur Kern. Every so often, I like to think back to that warm day in March with birds singing outside, the buds on the trees, the first harbingers of spring. At the time, none of us realized how deeply this meeting would affect all of our lives. 
or how a single apartment in Vienna would unite our families forever. Years later, Arthur called our first meeting one of the highlights of his life. Referring to the famous nostalgic expression, he said, sometimes you can't go home again. But he added, I did, and it was magnificent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lily. What a beautiful